Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see so many people have come, especially considering there are uh, three other very good speakers speaking at the same time as me. So thank you. Um, if anybody was expecting me to give a talk on impromptu and asynchronously uh, or dependently typed async, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, I'm going to be talking today about generic, <laughs> generic derivation. Um, and and the, 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 reason, the reason is that uh, I, I was at Lambda World uh, last week, and I've, I've got, maybe you know, I've, I've got a few libraries I've been working on and uh, sort of trying to bring up to production quality standard. And I had this library called Magnolia for uh, a few months now, and it wasn't quite really ready to be used. I had, a, I had some concerns with the API, and it, it, it wasn't, I, f I felt ready to start promoting and start talking about. And I spoke to uh, Zainab Ali at, uh, at Scala World, and she, she actually made me answer some questions for her that drove me, in, in the space of probably half an hour, to come to some solutions to problems I'd had for days. Problems I'd worked on, uh, problems I'd, I'd spent days working on trying to get a decent API for this, this library. And um, so I'm, I'm extremely grateful to her for just going through that process with me. And it, it came together very quickly once, once you did, uh, which gave me a week until my next conference, this one, to, to go and implement that. And, and a couple of days ago, I, I, I felt like I was in a position to change my talk, which is why we have this suggestively titled talk instead of the impromptu one. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to break it into three parts uh, of, I would say, increasing difficulty. Uh, so try and hang in for the first part. Um, second one, don't worry if it gets a little bit difficult. And third one, um, it's probably directed more to macro writers in, in the audience. Um, I don't know if anyone went to, did anyone go to Etienne's talk earlier on, um, it was called uh, Deduction Automatique d'Instance de Type Class at Ec Shapeless. Not, not many. Or, hand, hands up? Okay, so uh, um, maybe I'm a little bit disappointed there aren't more people from that talk coming to this one. But uh, this, this one's going to be um, Deduction Automatique de Type Class Sans Shapeless. <laughs> So I'll cover some, some details of uh, what generic deriva derivation is, what I, what I mean by this, this phrase, especially in, in Scala. So I've tried to come up with a summary. Generic derivation allows us to generate type classes. Um, hands up if you don't know what a type class is. Zero hands. I don't know if, I don't know if by asking the question that way I've I've encouraged people to keep their hands down out of embarrassment. Um, don't be afraid to put your hands up when I ask questions like that. Obviously, that makes no difference. Um, but I, I think, I think we've, we've had exposure to type classes as a feature of many conferences for two or three years now. And uh, three years ago, I think that a few people would have raised their hands. Uh, now I'm happy to say um, people either already know about type classes or at least justifiably, justifiably too embarrassed to, to say. Um, Anyway, generate type classes for types we don't know uh, beforehand uh, by composing together, in some way, as yet undefined, type class instances that we do know. That's a very general, uh, general explanation of what, what I intend to do. And I'm going to work with one of the simplest type classes you'll ever encounter. If, if you haven't seen the show type class, you probably wonder why it even exists, because all it does is uh, converts some type to a string. It gives a string representation of that type, t, in, in this case. So that is the definition. It has one method, takes, takes a value of type, some t, and returns a string. Really, really simple stuff. And on the bottom half of the slide, you can see how you use it. You, you, you pull in uh, an implicit show type class for the particular type you're trying to show. In this case, it's an integer. And you call the show method, and you pass it the, the value. Uh, and this will, very unsurprisingly, give you the string with the digits 4 and 2 next to each other. Does anyone 
here know or familiar with single, uh, single abstract method inference in Scala? Put your hands up. And hands up if you don't. Okay. So it's about half and half. And um, I, I would like, if nothing else in this talk, to teach you this um, somewhat orthogonal feature of Scala in one slide. Uh, this is a very convenient way of avoiding boilerplate from Scala 2.12 onwards. Uh, it's available in the 2.11 uh, with, a, with a flag. But the, the, the Scala compiler is now able to work out that if you have a trait, such as, such as the show type class interface, which has one method which is abstract, instead of building an entire, or writing the, the syntax to build an entire uh, class, so new show of int and then putting braces around it, then def show and then taking the parameter, you can just provide a lambda in this case, underscored up to string. And it's, it's clever enough to work out that because there's only one abstract method, and because it's possible to match the types up, now underscored up to string isn't, isn't typed in itself, but it's even able to infer that we're talking about an int going to, uh, to a string. That is sufficient for a definition for the, the int, uh, int version of the show type class. So this is a, a massive uh, help when reducing boilerplate. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to refer to it a, a few times later on. Um, is everyone okay with that? All makes sense? Um, for people who hadn't seen it before, does it look exciting, useful? Yeah, good. I, 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 showed, I showed it to Sam Halliday a couple of weeks ago, and he loved it for two reasons. Sam types. So, um, the, we, we, we're going to ge generally uh, derive a few different things, but um, in, in, in Scala, uh, we, we have um, a version of product types which um, are called case classes. And I'm going to do some derivation in a non-automatic non way. So, we've got our, our show type class. If I go over here, you can see my cursor. There we are. We have a, we have a show type class. And I'm going to provide instances of show for string and int. And what we want to do is come up with uh, an instance of show that works for a, a person. And the way we would write it, here, here is our definition of person, and we, we note that the parameters are, are typed as uh, uh, having a string and an integer, which we just happen to have exactly the right show type classes for already. And the way we could do that, again, I'm using SAM types in all three of these, uh, all three of these definitions. We, we simply provide the, the lambda corresponding to that single abstract method, which takes a person and returns a string. And you can see I'm using, I'm making reference to these existing type class instances we have for string and for int calling show on them and passing them the, uh, oh, that, sh that should say p.name and p.age, but um, you, you, you can see what it's trying to do. We could, if we wanted to, um, for example, put these into a, um, put, put the values into a list and then call dot make string on the list, and that would maybe be a little bit easier to see how that becomes generic. But right now, this is, there's nothing generic about this. We're doing it all manually. And likewise for coproduct types. So uh, is anyone not familiar with coproducts? Uh, do, do you know um, you probably used either? Either is a, is a binary coproduct type. In, in, in the sense that a, a product type has values for all of the parts of it, the parameters, a coproduct type will have values for just one of the parts. And this makes probably more sense if you think of a sealed trait. You have an instance of some sealed trait, let's say entity. It will either be a person or it will be an organization. They both extend entity and there are no other, there are no other types which extend uh, entity. So it must be one of these. Uh, by virtue of being sealed, you can't create new, new, new subtypes. So this is, this is Scala's particular, uh, certainly not the only one, but it, it's Scala's particular representation of a coproduct type. 
And the way we do that, the way we work with that is uh, a little bit different from the, uh, the product type. Uh, we would typically match on uh, our, our entity type. So we've got, a, we've got uh, the return type expected is show of entity, so we just need to provide the lambda. E is an entity, we match on the entity. If it's person, we use the show person type class, the one we had on the previous slide. If it's an organization, we, uh, we use some show org type class instance. Nothing here about where these type classes come from. Uh, that, that, that is to be, uh, to be worked out later. But you can see the code, at least from a, a manual point of view, isn't, isn't so complicated. It's just that if you had lots of, uh, lots of these case classes, lots of these sealed traits, um, let's say generally they're ADTs, if you had lots of these, you'd be writing all of these instances manually for every single one. And that gets quite tedious quite quickly. And there's a lot of boilerplate involved. So, um, what we want to be able to do with automatic uh, generic derivation is to simply write this, to not need to write each of those, uh, each of those instances. What, what it says is if we have a type class for all of the parameter types in our case class, then we want to be able to uh, generically derive a type class corresponding to that particular type, that, that, that case class. And if we have type classes corresponding to all of the subtypes of a particular seal trait, then we want to automatically generate uh, a corresponding, um, in this case, an entity, corresponding type class instance for that, um, that, that, that show type class. By the way, um, I think for most of the talk, certainly for this, I've, show, show is an invariant, uh, is an invariant, uh, the, 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 the generic parameter in, in the show type class is invariant, it's not covariant or contravariant. So um, we can't, there's nothing automatic about having, if, if you have a, a show for entity that you, you can't by default, um, implicit search won't find that as a solution to uh, a show of person or a show of company. So um, you don't have to worry about complex variance issues, which is uh, which, which often enter uh, the equation when working with complex types in Scala. So that's that's not a problem here. So in in, in general, what what can we derive? Um, so Magnolia, which I'm going to talk about in the next in the next part. Uh, is, is a macro, and it gives you a way of producing type classes corresponding to seal traits to case classes. Those are the two common, uh, or the, the two maybe most interesting cases. Uh, but also case objects, value classes. So a value class is um, where we have a class that wraps a single value, and it's compiled down to uh, just, just the primitive in the bytecode. So it's, it's generally quite efficient. Um, but a value class has at most a single parameter. Uh, and tuples, which you can think of as a little bit like case classes, but without a name. That's kind of one dimension in which we can, in which we can do generic derivation. Another dimension is for different type classes. So we can do it for things like show, for equality, or the, the equ type class. Um, those I think of as both uh, contravariant type classes. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, but also covariant type classes like decoder. Um, contravariant things take as input the generic parameter. Covariant type classes return the uh, value of the generic type. So that, 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 is, that is the main difference. Um, or even simple things like default. The default type class will give you some default instance of that particular type. It takes no input. It just returns a, a single value of that type. So default for int is, I mean, zero would be a reasonable choice, uh, but certainly not the only one. And then um, we have derivations of particular instances of these. Um, that, that shouldn't be there. That should, that should point to this. So, well, actually, it can point to this as well. So de derivations for particular instances of the, of the above. Um, 
Dealing with the, the, the five items in the first bullet point is done by Magnolia. It has the capacity to work with these, these different things. The code that's required to derive the different type classes is generally provided by the, either the type class author or if, if, you, if the type class author hasn't provided that by someone who's using that, that particular type class. And then derivations of the particular instances happen in your user code at the moment you demand an implicit of the appropriate type, okay? So let's get on to uh, introducing my particular solution to the generic derivation problem, which is, uh, it goes nowhere near shapeless and is very much an alternative uh, with, with, I think, some benefits over, over the shapeless approach. So very broadly speaking, Magnolia is a macro for allowing type class authors and users to write simple, fast, and I think impor importantly, debuggable generic derivations for arbitrary type classes. Uh, simple, fast, and debuggable all sound really good. I have currently solved two of those three. Uh, and I have an answer for the third. We'll see. So it's, it's not huge. It's, it's about 300 lines of code. Uh, it's maybe longer. I've probably spent longer on those 300 lines than any other 300 line fragment of, of a project I've, I've got anywhere else. Uh, it's uh, available or will be available under an Apache 2 license. Um, and it, it, it works. Um, everything I'm about to show you uh, meets the, the correctness uh, criterion. Uh, and it will produce, produce working code. Uh, it still needs more real-world testing. Uh, I, have, I have a number of tests, not many, but they, they, they test a variety of different shapes of type, type class, and they all, they all work. But um, like I said, it made a lot of progress in the last week, and there's a lot of future still to come that it, that it could potentially be, uh, be used in, and there's a lot of bugs that may yet be found. So that, that, that is the status. So one thing to observe is that there is no um, standard way of composing, um, composing existing type class instances into a new type class instance. The solution for each type class is going to be different. It's going to be a different solution for show, a different solution for uh, equ or equality, a uh, different solution for a decoder. So it, it's a given. Uh, well, I'm, I'm telling you it's a given that we do need to write some code for each one of those type classes. What I want to do and what, what Magnolia's API tries as hard as possible to do is to minimize the amount of code you need to write or the amount of particularly boilerplate type code you need to write to, 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 to produce those, um, the, the, those, those instances, uh, the, those derivation instances from which it will... Uh, it will be able to generate more, more type classes on demand. So there are four things you need. Only two of them are really particularly difficult. So my derivation interface, now I'll explain, hopefully I'll remember later what, to explain why interfaces in quotes, but you need four things. Uh, a type constructor which defines how the generic type, let's call it T, gets into the type class. So that will literally be a line which says, I think probably my next, I'll show that on the next slide, it's, it's very trivial. Um, a method for defining how we combine multiple parameters into the same, or oh, multiple type classes from parameters into a new type class. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, on the, on the dual side if you like, how we split um, seal traits into subclasses, and, and how we how we combine those uh, th th those those type classes corresponding to each subclass into a, into a uh, into a into a new type class instance, and then there's a very there's one line of boilerplate which is just a method to call the macro from within this object you define. So all of these go into one object. Uh, we're we're going to call that uh, show derivation. You could actually put it on the you could put it on the, the, the companion object for show if you are both the author of the type class and the author of the derivation. No, no problem there, and you get, uh, you actually get the implicit stuff or the, the implicit, uh, it, 
the, the macro is in implicit scope by default, just by virtue of that. So we define the type class type type, type class of t equals show of t. Not very hard. And in most cases, it will, it will literally be a, a line like this. Uh, there are some, case, some, some cases where maybe your type class has an additional parameter that you want to be fixed. And you need to tell Magnolia which one is the one that is generic. Otherwise, it doesn't know. Uh, so we've got some more stuff coming. So I'll spend a little while on this, on this slide. This is the definition of, or this is, this is Show's definition of a join implementation. So I'll, I'll talk you through it, then I'll try and explain why it, it, it is like that. So can you, can you all see the cursor there? So the method must be called join. It must take one type parameter, which is the generic type. It must take one parameter, which uh, is a join context, which corresponds to both the, uh, the type class we're deriving and the generic type of that type class. Uh, those are kind of the only constraints. So I haven't said anything about this parameter here. The context is something you as the author don't need to worry about because the macro will generate that. It will, it will create a, an instance of this join context for you to work with. So one value of this, uh, this context type is parameters. It gives you... Um, things of type param, again parameterized, corresponding to each parameter in a, in a given case class. Now, of course, when we're writing this, we, we, we don't know what case class we're working with. It might have one parameter, it might have zero, it might have 22. So we have to write this in a way where we, we, we really don't know anything about the, uh, about the parameters, about the types, about how they, what, what they're called. Uh, so the code is doing stuff that would be really trivial to do if we were writing it with that knowledge, but as we don't have that, we have to write it in a, in a very generic way. So first of all, I'm going to map over the parameters, maybe not too surprising, and I'm going to create a string from those based on uh, p.label p equals uh, and then something else. So p.label gives you the name of that parameter. And then, maybe, maybe not too surprising again, we want to have on the right-hand side of that equal sign the actual value that we're showing. Now, bear in mind that uh, a case class may have parameters of types which are other case classes, which have parameters that are types of other case classes, and the recursion can happen very, really very deeply. And uh, we, we don't know any of that at this point. So all we know is that for every parameter, if, if this is going to be a successful derivation, and it's not always, but if, if it's going to be a successful derivation, then we will have got, at the point this, this code is, uh, is executed, we will have got a type class corresponding to the type of that parameter. That is p.typeclass. And we happen to know from the type of param that it is a show. So we know that the compiler is happy to compile this. It, it, it type checks that we can call show on that type class. OK, so far. And then the parameter we pass to that show, remember it's of type T, we don't have, we don't know the names of the values in the, we don't know the names of the parameters in our case class. It's, it's, it's unknown. But this param provides us with a method which allows us to get that value for each different parameter. And we are doing this generically for each different parameter in turn. And what we do is we dereference our value, which I, I didn't really talk about, but is, is sort of lingering over here as, a, as, as the, uh, the next application of this, uh, this, this join here. This is our t. This is our value of type t. We can dereference that value of type t and get something that is of the right type, and the, the compiler will check this, it won't let you put something else in its place, it will put that as a parameter to show, and it will know that the types match up. Because both of these, uh, both p.typeclass and p.dereference come from the same p, and the compiler is able to work out that it is a safe operation to do this. It knows that the types do match. 
So having got all of those, we've got now for every parameter, x equals then the value of x for each parameter. We're just going to call make string on those. We're going to use the, the type name, which again comes from the context, the join context. That is the name of the case class, whatever the type is called. Uh, we, we put an opening bracket. We fill in some commas in the middle and a closing bracket. So that this gives us, uh, I think, a reasonable representation of uh, showing any particular case class. So there's a little bit of, uh, you have to be a bit uh, careful with uh, how we write this in a generic way because we know nothing. But hopefully what, what you can see there is, it's, I mean, it's not a lot of code. And by parametricity, it kind of writes itself. Uh, the only thing show can possibly take is a T that's been dereferenced by uh, the dereference method on the same param. So it, it kind of joins up. What, what do people think? Is, is, this, is this a little bit complicated, a bit weird, or kind of okay? Kind of okay. Uh, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does. Um, so th you, you could mean two things, two different things by that, but the answer is yes to both of them. Uh, so you, you will notice that I've, I've included, in fact, I think my next slide, yes. So what the macro will do is it will try and generate this case class. Now, it might be generating this case class as a result of being called recursively several times, uh, but essentially it will, it will try to apply this, this join method, which, we, which the macro will produce the code which calls join, and it will try to, to apply it to something of the, the appropriate type class type. In this case, show of foo is maybe some particular instance of a, of a case class. Now, if you look carefully, I have only partially applied join there because there is this additional t parameter here. So the, the type of this is actually t goes to string. And that actually matches up with uh, show of foo. Okay? So this is, the compiler is perfectly happy to type check this, and it is, it is fine. Uh, by the way, if you had written this in a way where your join method returns actually a show of foo, like if, if this code said new show of t, and then you wrote def show equals and so on, that would also work. Because all the macro is doing is substituting the code in. There's no, there's no interface in the sense of traits, in the, in the object-oriented sense, that you need to adhere to. All you need to do is make sure that when the compiler or when the macro generates this code here, that that code there will compile. So this could you could you could add an implicit parameter on there if you wanted to pull in an additional implicit parameter. It wants to do I don't know why you'd want to, but there might be reasons. Uh, that that is that is certainly uh, possible. All it has to do is fit the right shape for the application that the that the macro generates. So normally we program to object-oriented style interfaces. This is a little bit different, um, but it's not, not without precedent. So four loops are kind of, four comprehensions are kind of the same, and when you actually generate a macro, this is the same, same sort of approach. It must have the right shape, but not so much fitting to a certain interface. And of course, there's no, it doesn't extend anything, so it's not, uh, um, it's not, not part of the, the, the signature there. So the other side is, is splitting. Um, Kind of similar approach. You'll see that that uh, V parameter of type T is again there, uh, available on, on the right-hand side. And this is, if we partially apply this, this will return something of type T goes to string. Uh, but this is a bit more. This is a bit more complicated, and uh, it'll make more sense if I if I tell you that cast is a partial function. What cast does is it will match, so we, we, have, we have the subtypes here, so list of subclasses of our, uh, our, our sealed trait, and for each one, we get a cast partial function, which will match, if and only if, 
the instance that we pass it, it happens to get passed down there, but the, the instance we pass it, pass it happens to be of the type for that sub, subclass. So taking, taking a step back, we have a list of subclasses. These are all the different possibilities for that, that seal trait. And we get, or the compiler generates for us, partial functions which match if and only if the value we pass them, the, the uh, t value we pass them, the seal trait value we pass them, happens to be of that subtype type. Okay, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, and then if, if we, I'll go, go backwards a little bit, if we, if we reduce all of those using or else, um, the compiler gives us a partial function, but we actually happen to know that that's a total function because it handles all of the cases. We, we know from context that uh, we are handling every single possible sub, subclass of the seal trait, therefore we've got all of them, and if we pass that any particular <laughs> v, here of, of, well, any particular t, then we will get a result back, we, that the partial function will match. So that, that explains sort of the outside. And then on the inside, all we do is we, um, we use the and then method, which takes the value that's been matched uh, and applies the, uh, we, we do actually need to apply cast to it again. We, we, the compiler isn't aware that the type of v is the subclass type it only knows still that it is uh, the type T here. But we're able to, again, call the show method on the, on the type class. We know it's show because we've got the type here. Uh, and the only thing that can possibly take is something that has been cast down by the, the cast method on the same S, the same subclass. So again, all the types line up, and parametricity main, means that this is kind of the only way you can write this. Uh, more or less, and uh, we end up with a, partial, with, with, a, with a total function, as I say, which we then apply our v to. And then what the, what the, uh, what the compiler will do is, like it did with join, it will call show derivation dot split. It will, it will construct a new value for subs, um, which you, you don't ever need to see, but it will give all of those subclasses, uh, it will pass in all of those subclasses, and um, by only partially applying it, it has the appropriate SAM type that it is an instance of show for our particular seal trait that we're trying to derive. So these are these are these have been written. This this this, this part of the API was the bit that uh, took me so long to, to actually get and, and and write down in a way that is actually type safe. Yeah, good question. Right, yes, good, good question. Would, would this ever look any different for another? Yeah, so uh, for, for any, um, any contravariant type class, no, generally. But you, the, the, there may be things you want to do. You may, um, so as, as part of the subclass, you, you, there is another method which gives you the name of the, the subtype. Um, and you may want to do these in a particular order based on, you've only really got the name to work with, but you may want to put them in alphabetical order or reverse alphabetical order or maybe count the number of parameters they have or so, something like that. You would, um, uh, you, you, could, you could sort them in some way that, that means when they get reduced, it tries one and then, um, well, that, sorry, that, that, that is more of an answer for the cases where we're not dealing with a contravariant type class where the, the input parameter is, say it was taking a string and it was parsing it into a T. So that, that becomes a string and that becomes a T. And in that case, we have to do things a little bit differently. I'm not going to show those examples because they're a little bit more complicated, but um, it, it's perfectly possible to do things sort of inside out as well. So this is the whole thing. Um, it's almost going off the slide, but it still just about fits. Uh, and this is, I think, reasonably short as a as a definition. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, 
OK. Is anyone else having problems with split? Right, so at least, at least one other person. So uh, can I ask, is, was it my explanation of uh, how this one works that was the problem? Was it the purpose of it? OK, so um, imagine you have, um, imagine our seal trait is called either, and it has two subtypes, left and right. And we have, we have type class instances for left, and we have a type class instance for, for right. But we don't have a type class instance for either. But we know that either can't possibly be anything other than a left or a right. It must be one of those, one of those two. So in the case where it's left, we want to use the, the instance for left, and we call dot show on it, and then get, get the string out. In the case where it's right, we use the right version of the show, and get the, get the value out. Uh, does, does having that concrete example help a little bit? Please? OK, yeah. So uh, in, in this code product, we have to deal with all, all the cases. And uh, a lot of people think of the name split. Because I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't mind changing the API uh, in the names of the methods if something more, uh, something clearer would work better. Sorry? Co-join, yeah. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a useful suggestion. <laughs> Dispatch. Dispatch. Uh, yeah, I work on the like, discriminant type thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I quite like Dispatch. Yeah, because that's kind of what it's doing, it's deciding where to send it. Um, in, 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 the, in the sense that it will only ever send it to one place, whereas with, with the join version, yeah. uh, it, it is sending, sending some data to all places. OK, I, I, I may run to go with that. Thank you. Uh, so th this, is, this is the full thing. Um, if I compare <coughs> that, by the way, this isn't, this, isn't a, um, uh, this isn't a talk to basically say how, how great Magnolia is versus Shapeless, uh, because Shapeless did something that we couldn't do before. And it, it, it opened up the whole possibility of, uh, of um, doing generic derivation. But, but the, way, the way it does it is, uh, it takes a different approach. Uh, the macros in Shapeless are smaller, they're probably easier to understand in isolation. But in order to use them, we need to compose together uh, a load of code that looks, looks like this. And for, for show, this is part of Kittens, which is Miles' uh, um, collection of CAPS type class derivation, uh, derivation support. Uh, but this is, so it's 100, 106 lines of code to get, uh, to get show work. I mean, well, that's a comment. Um, and the comment actually says, this doesn't work. <laughs> uh, uh, nevertheless, this, this, is, this is something that couldn't be done before. It, it's been working, people have been using it for two, maybe three years now. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I think, improving on the, the prior arc. So that's just there for, for comparison. Um, I mentioned the formula of different shapes of type class, covariant, contravariant. Um, and not, not just where the, the, the generic type parameter is in a single abstract method. And maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not just a single abstract method, it might be multiple abstract methods that you have to implement. Um, that, that T may occur in parameter position that might appear in, uh, in the return value. Um, I've, I've given some examples here of, of contravariant ones and covariant ones. Um, and in this, this particular example, a, a decoder <coughs> might be able to decode things from strings, might be able to decode from, might be able to use the same type class to decode from JSON or from XML. Uh, so these are all catered for by, by Magnolia. <coughs> so ha has anyone, I don't think I asked before, how many people use Shapeless's derivation? Oh, so there's actually quite a few people. Um, what happens when you try to derive something and it doesn't work? 
exactly that. It doesn't work and you don't know why. Is that, is that kind of what happens? So here's, here's some code. It's not, not that much code, but let's say I try and, uh, try and derive a generic uh, a, a show entity. Oh, is it? Okay. We've got two microphones here. Did 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 you lose any of my any things I was saying? It probably wasn't important anyway. <laughs> we we have um, I've I've got, I've got like a not a not too complicated uh, ADT structure here. We've got a seal trait and we've got several case classes. And let's say we try and do this and it doesn't work. Where do we start? Where do we start to look? Well, we probably we'll probably try and do something a little bit easier than an entity. So maybe we'd try, try and do uh, an organization, a show of organization. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. But it, it's, it's a lot of work. It takes several compilations to work out where the problem is, is occurring. With Magnolia, um, what you get is this. You get what looks like a stack trace, which takes you through the parameter names and which types they are in to see how it got to the one that's the problem. And the problem happens to be that it couldn't get a show instance for Boolean. Boolean uh, was the type of sales tax. Where was that? Oh, that was in, in country. Where was country? So if you have a very complicated ADT, this is, I think, extremely useful for directing you straight to the place where at least the first problem occurs. There may be subsequent problems once you fix this one, but it, it should save you a huge amount of time in finding finding where the issues are. And it takes you all the way back down to the place where you actually asked for the, for the type class. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased with how that, that worked out. Uh, you'll notice there are three different kinds of lines in here. Uh, parameters, these are in case classes, and um, co-products. Uh, there's also chained implicits, and you've probably seen chained implicits or maybe called the, the, the lemma pattern. Um, if we're deriving a set, there's often an implicit in scope that derives sets of show for sets of things, provided we can derive a show for the thing. Uh, so that, that is why that appears in there as well. So that's kind of a tour of how you use it as a type class author. And um, I've, got, I've got the sign that says I've got five minutes left, but I've also been told that I can go on as long as I want. So <laughs> I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the signs. <laughs> Uh, and I don't mind if anyone leaves uh, in, in five minutes' time. There might be something better going on outside. But I, I'm going to talk, uh, particularly because this is, a more, this is a more challenging part of the, of the talk, and it might be less interesting uh, to hear about how I implemented this in, in a macro in Scala. Um, yeah, you, you can. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm nervous that you want to ask a question. Uh, I haven't tried functor, no. So functor is a, a type class that's parameterized on another, yes. So I don't know how you would, so uh, that, that, yeah, right. Yeah, so that, that won't, so it's a good question, yeah. Um, that won't work. Yeah, so, so this is higher, higher kinded type class derivation. So that's something I can't do, and that's something that may be, um, there's, there's work to be done. Uh, <laughs> I, I... Sorry, Daniel. Why, why would it have stopped? In, like... We st stopped in protest. I'm not deriving any more functors. Um... It would be nice if we could, but at the moment it's only uh, star-kinded things. Um, but that's something which uh, could be very useful. Yes. Oh, okay. Don't, don't worry. Yeah, I'll come on to that. Yeah. So let's think about how we might try and implement this. And, and you'll see this says naive here, which basically means that this won't work. But I'll talk about it anyway. So if you have a case class, we split it into its parameters in the macro. So we basically do some analysis of the, the structure and the definition. 
seal traits we break down into the, into the subtypes. And then for each one, we, we have a, a, a new type corresponding to that parameter or the subtype that we want to try and do implicit search for. So from the macro, we have a method called infer implicit value, which we call, which will hopefully bring in an, an implicit which corresponds to that, either that parameter or the subtype. And bear in mind that our macro is called by implicit search, so we, that implicit search can end up calling our macro again. So it's re-entrant, and it may be many, many levels, many levels deep. Uh, so either the, either the implicit search finds um, like a simple val or def instance for that, that type class it's looking for, or it ends up recursing. And in all likelihood, for the, the examples that are interesting, it will, it will recurse. Um, uh, this does not work uh, as stated, unfortunately, because of recursive data types. So let's let's follow that algorithm, if you can even call it that, for uh, for this here. So we we're going to break tree down into subclasses. The subclasses are leaf and branch. So let's deal with leaf. It's a case class. We'll look at the parameters. There's one parameter, value, which is the type string. We need a show of string. Um, Easy. There's one somewhere in somewhere in scope or an implicit scope. Uh, that's done. Let's try branch. So branch is another case class. We need to deal with each of these parameters in turn. Let's look at left. Left needs a show of tree. Okay. Let's try and derive a tree. So definition of tree is up here. It has two subtypes. Let's deal with each of those in turn. Leaf and branch. And and y y what happens is the compiler will um, end up. It would infinitely recurse were it not, no, it will infinitely recurse. Um, a black box macro actually will, uh, will identify that infinite recursion is happening and stop. A white box macro will keep going until something worse happens. Uh, so this, with, with our naive approach, this, this will not work. And this, this, is, this is where most of the work into Magnolia has gone. Everything I talked about before that is not not that hard. It's, it's dealing with these complicated cases. Complicated, but actually not that uncommon. Now, Shapeless's solution is to use uh, uh, another macro called lazy. And this, I, I, don't, I don't know how it works exactly, but it essentially breaks the infinite recursion. You, you wrap a type in lazy, uh, a type that you're searching for with implicit search in, in this lazy type, and it will, it will not continue recursing. Uh, I, I don't take that approach. Uh, I don't take the approach because I don't want, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing my derivations in terms of uh, implicits, which call other implicits. I'm, I'm simply, I've simply got a macro which does all of it inside the macro. So the, the, the lazy wrapping would happen on a parameter to one of those uh, one of those implicits, one of, one of the several implicits you need to write for, for shapeless. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. I, I am using implicit search, but, well, I'm, I'm partially using implicit search. Uh, so instead of lazy, what Magnolia does is it identifies when implicit, when infinite recursion would be happening. It, it identifies the cycle in the types. And instead of continuing, it just refers back to the one we've already started. So it assigns it to a def and refers back to it. It, it, it isn't actually that easy. So, uh, there is, there's, there's a whole thing from it. it when, when the macro calls implicit search, it, it may find a super, super implicit, uh, or it may end up being invoked by another form of implicit search. Uh, and when, when it goes via, when it ends up calling itself through implicit search, that creates a new macro context. And assuming like the nested macro implication returns some AST, in order for AST to get back in the macro that's called, the outer macro, it must be type charged. And it must type in isolation. Now, if you have a reference in there to 
<laughs> this is the one for you. John, you continue shouting. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 If, if you have in your in, in the in the nested map that was generated tree that refers to something which only exists in the code generated by the outer macro, the tree produced by that inner macro will not type it. It's referring to something that it doesn't think exists. So that will fail. And implicit search will think it can't it can't find well it hasn't found a yeah. suitable implicit map in your type. Does that make sense? It makes sense probably a lot more if you haven't written a macro, especially <laughs> if you've written a macro that, that doesn't just search. So by by using implicit search recursively, we um, we would love to be able to refer to things which don't exist and then just type check them once at the end, but because we're using implicit search, uh, we have these intermediate steps where everything is type checked and type checking unfortunately fails. So we kind of, we, it looks like we're presented with a choice between infinite recursion, which is bad, or failing type checking, which is bad. So is there a solution? There's a solution, good. Okay, <laughs> I know the solution is to circumvent the type checks that, that may fail. So, uh, <coughs> if you've ever written a macro, uh, who has written a macro at some point? Right, so a bit less than half, I think. So, when you write a macro, the method that actually implements the macro and operates on ASTs is very much the ordinary method. It's, it's normal code. It happens to work on a bunch of types and has a, a quite a complicated reflection API that you need to use to make sense of it, but it is, um, it is just a method. So what Magnolia does is it calls, it goes out, calls, calls out to implicit search, and it, it notices when it has called itself. So when the, when an invocation of Magnolia is being called from an existing invocation of Magnolia, it aborts immediately, fails, it fails. I have global state, but this is global state, global private, it's, it's, pri it's, it's, it, it's, it's private, it's private to Magnolia. So there is an object that is accessible only by Magnolia and exists only at compile time. Um, this, this, this actually, uh, according to a conversation I had with Mirko yesterday, were, were a multi-threaded compiler to exist, um, it, would, it would work by virtue of um, just good luck. No, I think it's genuinely not a problem, um, but it, it is yet to be tried on, uh, on Hydra. Never, nevertheless, um, there, there, is, there is some global state which... Uh, gets mutated when when the macro uh, aborts, and we we uh, end up with either the, the the nested invocation of the macro returning a an implicit it's found from somewhere else, just like a val or a def, that, which is great. We use that one, or uh, it it knows that it it would have end, it would have called itself and aborted, and in that case. Because the macro implementation method is just a method, we can call that method directly, and we effectively bypass the type checking on the way out. So we, we use our macro implementation method to call itself and get it to derive a new type without going via implicit search. We only go via implicit search first to check that that's what we would have done anyway. Is that clear to anyone? <laughs> but it's a macro. Maybe. Let's try it later. Yeah, so maybe, maybe this can be generalized to other problems. Um, but, but essentially, we, we've, we've found a way to avoid 
uh, avoid infinite recursion and avoid the problems with, uh, with, with type checking that are imposed on us by using implicit search from within the macro. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than even, even what I've explained there and which nobody understood, but uh, that, 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 that's why it's taken months rather than, uh, that, that's why 300 lines took me months rather than, rather than days. It gets even more complicated because when we're doing implicit search, we might have this situation where we have an implicit which, which demands another implicit. So if, we're try, if we changed our tree structure to have not just a left and right subtrees in a, in a branch, but we had a whole list of possible branches. Uh, if we're deriving a show, maybe we've got a list show in scope which will work for any uh, it, it'll, it'll work on a list of T if and only if there is an implicit of show for a single, <coughs> single T. Now, if you think about how our implicit search algorithm works, it may well find this, but it will, again, in order to get the show of T, which happens to be tree here, it will end up invoking... Magnolia again, but not directly. It'll be an indirect invocation of Magnolia from within uh, an existing one. And we, we, we can't deal with this so, uh, so, so easily as we did the previous, previous time. So I, I've, I've got a long explanation here. I'm, I'm probably not going to go through it, but um, I use a different trick for these cases, which is to identify the cases where we are not, not directly recursive via implicit search, but indirectly recursive via implicit search. And I return, I make sure I return a tree which type checks. Type checks, but is actually nonsense code. It refers to something which has the right type, but is not a useful value. It's a, it's a dummy. A dummy in place of where it would have referred to an outer method. So where, where there was a thing that uh, would have failed type checking, I replace that thing, in this case a reference to another method, with uh, a, a dummy value which has the right type. And then I have an additional step in my macro which I only ever run on the outer invocation, the outermost invocation, the top level one, which goes through the entire tree and removes the dummy reference. And this allows us to write code like this and have it just work without, without any um, additional thoughts from the user. There's only a, only a couple more slides. Um, th there is a slightly interesting, I think, I think useful side effect of, of this approach. This approach of um, aborting uh, nested recursions, uh, nested implications of, of Magnolia which is that our implicit prioritization rules aren't so complicated. What, what this means is that at the, 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 the first invocation of Magnolia, the top level one, that will have the priority. And anyone who's had problems with implicit priorities, basically everyone probably, um, the, the implicit you define for generating... Um, uh, generating a show, for example, that will have the appropriate priority for wherever it's placed. If it's in the companion object, it's in implicit scope. If it's in local scope, it'll have higher priority. So that, that is totally unsurprising. It's a good, good thing. But any, any nested invocations, it will only ever use Magnolia for those as a last resort. So it, it, it is the implicit of last resort where it is being called recursively. Now, I think this is a useful default. I, th I think this is what you want most of the time. Uh, what, what, you, what you probably don't want is having Magnolia starting to decompose things like options and lists because they happen to be made of case classes. That, that's probably not where you want to go. So it, it, it is the, 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 uh, uh, the implicit of last resort. But if, for some reason, you did want it to have higher priority, all you need to do is explicitly call this, this gen method, uh, just up, up here, 
um, and assign it to an implicit, and you put that implicit, or whichever particular subtype you wanted to give higher priority, you put that in local scope. So I think sensible default with an escape hatch if it's not what you wanted. And this was a problem I fixed uh, yesterday, which um, is the one that, that was described in, uh, in this comment here by, by Miles. What happens if we, we had not just a, uh, an ADT, but a GADT with, with a type parameter? We don't know that T is, is a, a nice, easy to work with string. Um, it, could be, it could be any type. Uh, and in this, this example, they are, they are covariant. So we've, we've got T's everywhere. And this happens to be exactly the, uh, an example of the thing that, that shapeless could not do. Um, it can't drive for ADTs which are both recursive and generic. So that's generic and it's obviously recursive. Um, after, I, after I solved it for non-recursive GADTs, it, it actually turned out that it just works for recursive ones. Um, I think the, 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 the tricks which Shapeless does interact badly with this combination of features. Um, for whatever reason, it, it, it turns out not to be a problem for, for Magnolia. And what I hoped I would be able to say to you, and I didn't do any testing on this until, until yesterday, was that because of the, the, the approach it takes to having a reduced amount of implicit search, um, that Magnolia would be vastly more performant than, uh, than Shapeless. What I discovered is it's about the same speed, which was disappointing. I was very disappointed to discover this. I, it, it went against my expectations. Uh, you may say that my expectations are too high and uh, over-optimistic, but uh, I, I got more or less about the same speed. And I, I was sort of wondering why when when Shapeless is doing all of this, and um, Magnolia is, at least conceptually in, in my mind, um, a, a simpler combination of things. And then I had a look. I didn't, that, that is just, uh, that's SBT there. I, I had a look at what code gets generated by the macro. And I'm going to compile, I, I don't really need to tell you what it is, but this is a relatively simple uh, this is a generic der derivation for a relatively simple case class, and I think it's a combination of uh, co-product and, and a product. So it, it does some does some compilation, uh, and then it generates that, and it is generating quite a bit more. And it, it actually went too fast. I, I can go up for quite a long time. This is all the code that got generated by that invocation. But, but, but it's, it's, it's a few invocations, but there is loads of it. This is loads and loads of code. And at this point, I realized that I am vastly <coughs> duplicating huge chunks of, of code. Um, often, you're generating the same type class multiple times because it appears in multiple parameters. Um, uh, yeah, if, 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 you can, if you can read that, it may be, maybe it's intriguing to see what, what actually gets generated. Um, uh, the, 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 the solution is more global state, but that, that's, as it turns out, that's actually no worse than it was before. Like, when, once you've gone with global state, you, you're all the way. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still paging up. If, you, um, if, I, if, I page up, if I page up very... Uh, um, if I page up very fast, or maybe, maybe it's not so obvious. The, 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 co the code is very, very, very repetitive. Uh, and like I said, there are, there are whole chunks of this, uh, this AST which are identical. And they're just assigned to different values. This is a problem both at compile time and runtime. And it is completely within my, uh, or within the macro's capability, not necessarily my capability, to identify where that, where, where that duplication happens and to, uh, to, to, uh, to prune and reference the, the, uh, the, um, this, this, this vast tree. And I, um, I am reasonably confident that I can, um, 
but by, by the way, most of the most of the time spent in, in compilation is in type checking this when the macro finally returns the AST. Most of the time is spent checking that all the types line up in this enormous AST. And it's maybe not surprising. Generating it is not, not that hard. Like gen generating the untyped tree is not, not that uh, CPU intensive. It's when it gets type checked. So my, my intention is to um, be a little bit smarter about what gets generated, uh, store, some th store, store, store some type classes in vowels, the recursive ones in, in defs, otherwise we get otherwise we get problems. And I think I can reduce the size of this in this particular example, probably by a factor of um, ten, maybe even a hundred, depending on depending on how how much our, our parameters are duplicated. Uh, and I, I hope I, I'm I'm reasonably confident that I can I can get better compiled performance than, than Shapeless has. The, the scope is there in a way that it's not available to Shapeless simply because I have the entire tree. And I have the possibility of, of analyzing not just the, the AST, but the code that generates the AST and, and simplifying it. So that, that is my hope, and that is the next step for, for Magnolia. Uh, for now, it is, uh, it is certainly no worse than, uh, than Shapeless. And... Um, Possibly, uh, in, in, a, in a few cases, it is, it is better. So uh, that is two of the three items on my, uh, on, on, on my feature list done. Hopefully, the third one won't be too long. Magnolia is, is available as source right now. I've not published a binary, but you can, you can check out the source on GitHub. There's a few tests there. They, um, uh, they, they will give you an example of what, what sort of... Or, there's some examples not just of um, invocations of generic derivation, but also of um, type class implementations for EEP and, uh, and, and a few others. So have a look there. There's, there's not a huge amount of code. You can look at the Magnolia macro itself, but it's um, 300 lines of very dense, very dense code. Um, and I, I hope, especially if you're using doing derivation already, I hope you you have a look at Magnolia. Um, don't be disappointed if it, doesn't, if it doesn't work straight away out of the box, but tell me if it doesn't and I can, I can work towards making it better. And I hope there's scope for it to become um, maybe the, 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 the go-to derivation library for Scala in the future. That's all I've got for now. Does anyone have any more questions? I know they were asked throughout. Gabriele. Uh, they, they are related. Sam is looking very closely at this, and I, I, I went to visit him, and we talked about how they could work together. Maybe we, we, didn't, we didn't talk in enough detail, I don't think, but uh, I was still fixing bugs that weren't really relevant to Sam. Sam is looking for ways to... Uh, define what I've got in my, my join and split API. Uh, he, he has uh, alternative ways of providing these with type classes called things like divide and probably co-divide. And uh, he, he's able to compose a few different type classes to get the same functionality. I think what he's got is maybe um, more natural in, in, a, uh, in a functional domain. If you're very familiar with some of these type classes already. already. Um, it'll maybe be quite natural to write these very trivial instances. Um, I think if, if you're not, then it, it's probably it's probably quite some overhead in, in understanding them. Uh, it would be an alternative to join and uh, distribute. You you would provide like I think it's four. He had three or four different instances you'd need to provide for each one. Um, he intends to use Magnolia to do the derivation, uh, the, the actual, the, 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 the complex part of the derivation. Yeah, but we haven't, we haven't worked out yet how they're going to, how they're going to join up. Uh, yeah. So, um, I'm not sure where Yes, I'm aware of this, and Miles has been working on it, I believe. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Well, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the global state that's helping me out there. Um, you, you could you could argue that I'm not really bypassing implicit search. I still use implicit search. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not rewriting the. I'm not rewriting the rules around implicit search. So you, you could... So I... So I have... Um, I mean, I, I use implicit search to find the type classes I... I the, well, to find the type classes I need um, in case they have higher priority than... Well, it, it, in case it finds something. Um, you, I could have written the macro in a way that doesn't even try implicit search and just decomposes the uh, each nested case class and assumes that it has highest priority in all cases. Um, that that would be possible as well. Um, I, I don't I don't see myself as um, bypassing implicit search so much as bypassing just the type checking that happens at the end of each. Uh, uh, when, when, when the tree is returned from implicit search. I think people are probably ready to go, unless, unless you've got a really good question. Um, we can probably wrap up there. Yep, thank you. <laughs>